Welcome to Dairy Robot Radio, the show that provides answers to your most pressing questions about dairy farming and automation. Each episode will focus on a major topic within the dairy industry and will feature experts throughout our industry and within Laylee to help provide information and different perspectives on automation. And now, here's your host, Balana Putz. Welcome everybody to another edition of Dairy Robot Radio as we tour the U.S. and Canada talking to producers living out a sustainable, profitable, and enjoyable life. Today we're going to make a stop in Loretto, Ontario with the ladies of Sheldon Creek Dairy. Hey ladies! Hello. Hello! Thanks for joining us. So you guys have a whole lot of cool new stuff going on. I don't think you ladies sit still based on what I know about you all and what we want to tell the world. Uh, family operation there in Loretto has a retail store. You're obviously you're connecting grass to glass, uh, producing a battery of really nice artisan dairy products. So tell the world what what are you guys? What's the what's the Sheldon Creek Dairy experience look like today? Yeah, so um, we've actually been farming on this land since 1953. And in 2012, we opened the on-farm dairy. And so today we've got a nice little farm store. We also wholesale our products to about 280 locations across Ontario. And just recently, we built our newest expansion of the voluntary milking system um, and a, a voluntary milking barn. I think there's a couple pieces of red equipment in there. Is that right? Yes, there's two A4 uh, Lily robots, uh, milking robots, and then we also have the um, the Juno, the newest Juno model, um, as well as a Luna. So the cows are well fed and well brushed. We call it the Luna Salon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. And Juno is actually A two D two. Yeah, Juno is known as R two D two by our children and the tour tour groups. <laughs> Perfect. So tour groups, why don't we just start there? So once, what all can we do and see and eat? What, what's the experience like there at Sheldon Creek? Yeah, so when you arrive um, at the farm, we do uh, events throughout the year that allow people to you know, really experience farm to table um, directly on farm and talking to farmers. Instead of, you know, today we're always educating ourselves because we have these lovely phones that give us data right in our hands. Um, which is very good, but sometimes, you know, we educate ourselves with YouTube or Netflix and we forget that there's actually people that are doing these things and that would be considered experts. So the challenge with us is that as farmers, it's really hard to, you know, tell our story through social media when we're quite busy, but also um, for consumers or people that want to know more, for them to just walk on a farm and be like, hey, I want to know about your cows. You know, it just doesn't happen. And so what we've done is we've um, tried to connect directly with those who are interested in learning about agriculture, about farming, and really telling the story of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis on a farming perspective and then also as a processing perspective. So when a tour comes here, they'll get a tour of the farm, um, which Emily is the lovely tour guide, and they get to see Luna's salon as well as the Juno. Um, they also get some samples of the product, in June, on June 15th, we have our annual day on the farm. And that day we have uh, about 6,000 people that come to the farm to experience these things. We also have other industries that are represented on that day. The pork producers, obviously the dairy farmers of Ontario. Um, we've got the chicken farmers. And it's just a great way to you know, really showcase the great things that are happening in the agricultural industry right here in our own backyard. Awesome. And so one of the new things that has launched there at the farm this year is the A2 milk. What are the benefits of A2 milk? And why did you decide to produce 100% of A2 milk? Well, you can blame Emily for that innovation. <laughs> um, Emily was in Australia three years, three years ago. Yeah. Has it been three years? Okay, so three years ago. And she came back and she said, you guys got to hear about this A2 milk. It's interesting they say that people who are you know have milk sensitivities or that can't drink milk and drink this milk and of course it just sounds too good to, to be true right so you're like yeah okay sure but there's quite a bit of research that was going on and quite a few articles that we kept reading and so um emily and and dad and mom all decided that we would start to exclusively use a2 uh, genetics in our herd 
and start to move towards 100% A2. Um, we realized that there was an opportunity to launch this product because we had the on-farm dairy, because we could literally um, track the cows that were making that milk all the way to the bottle that it was that milk was bottled into. And so we, I guess, took the risk and the opportunity. And on June 14th this past year, we launched the first A2 milk in Canada. And this past weekend, we launched the first chocolate milk A2 in Canada, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so I guess the excitement about this is that milk is is magic, really, if you think about it. There's not a factory in the world that can make this product. Um, and the only, the only mammals that can make it, uh, when it comes to cows, as mammals, they have to be happy and they have to be healthy, or else they won't make milk. And so there's this, a real science, but there's a real magic behind Mother Nature producing milk. And so for us, with, a, with the A2 milk, it was you know, putting a product that was back out to market that would allow people to enjoy milk again. Um, people that have gone to almond milk or soy beverage or, um, you know, there's a million of them out there on the market. This provides another alternative to the alternatives. And I always say, like, at what point do we start, you know, drinking science experiments instead of what nature has brought to us? And so A2 milk is just another opportunity for people to drink milk again and feel great about it. Um, it's got the 16 essential nutrients. It tastes great. And it's really exciting to see and to hear the comments of people who you know call and say I haven't had a latte like this in 20 years because I haven't been able to drink milk and you know I'm I'm, drink, I'm eating a bowl of cereal right now I just want to say thank you you know that's a really rewarding experience yeah that's that's got to feel good and and not only you know your hearts feel better but the good product that you're producing is natural and I think we've come full circle in our society of to your point preservatives add 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 and now we're back to the, the real raw natural stuff <laughs> it's funny how that all happened right for sure so each of your cows has a pedigree why why is the pedigree of the herd so important for your operation and for and for those maybe for those listeners that don't know what a pedigree necessarily is emily how help help our listeners understand what a cow's pedigree is and why it's important to you guys Sure. So a cow's pedigree is basically their family tree. It's telling us who their mother was, who their grandmother was, uh, who their grandfather was, and all the way back, um, we have them all the way back to 20 generations for some cows. Um, and so along with the pedigrees, they've improved, like genetics has improved greatly um, on farms across across Canada and across the world. Um, and ourselves, pedigrees matter to us because um, we we are always striving for improvement. And so when we can see um, the improvement from a granddaughter to a daughter, and whether that's in milk production or even this A2, using A2 sires, we see grandmothers that weren't A2, um, and then their granddaughters become A2 producing cows because of the sires that we've used. And so our pedigrees are, are important to us because they show us how how we have improved in the years or, or if there's any faults that have been made, um, you know, how to fix those faults. So it's something to look back on and to to really look at your progress and, and to reflect on what you want to do for the future. So uh, in Canada, we have uh, what's called the master breeder and it's a lot on your pedigree. So it, um, we have star brood cows, which are uh, cows that have daughters that are well producing and and more and more daughter the more daughters that are well producing that they have and that score well so they're built sound and built very well um the more daughters that they have of those the more points that go towards that one cow that produced all that offspring and um as from a business perspective on the farm that uh that's really good to have because it means that you have bred great cows and that they last and that they produce and more great cows so the less that you have to buy in um and the more that you can you can breed and and raise on your own farm the better it is very nice so along with great genetics comes great nutrition that we have to put in our bodies. You know, to my to my non-ag friends who ask a lot of questions about cows, and, and I said, well, it's just, it's just like your athlete son or daughter. You're probably not just letting them eat anything. Same rules apply for cows. So 
you know, do you guys have an individual meal plan per se? How do you keep track of what nutrition goes into the cows? Yeah, so we feed uh, what is called a TMR or a total mixed ration. And so we basically have a large Cuisinart mixer that goes onto our tractor and we put all the ingredients on it, all of which are grown on the farm here. So um, it's haylage, it's corn silage, uh, and then we put some uh, high moisture corn and soybeans. So uh, we actually put the soybeans in with the minerals, so it's pelletized um, and put in. Um, and then we mix it all up so that each bite is the same. And so that when cows go to the bunk and they take a bite of it, it it's going to be the same as what the neighbor got. So that And that's, that's so that we know that those cows are each getting the minerals that they need and the vitamins that they need in order to continue to be healthy every day. Um, to top that off, because some cows will obviously eat more in the bunk and others will eat less, um, and some cows will produce more milk and some will produce less. And so the ones that produce more milk, they need more energy in order to keep that, keep that up and, and be sustainable in that sense. So at the robot level, when the cow goes in to get milked, um, they get a pellet, um, and it's it's a bit of a treat so that it it brings them to the robot so that it's something for them to look forward to when they get in there. But it's also something to supplement them so that if they're not getting enough at the bunk, then we make sure that they get topped up in the robot and so that they can keep their 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 weight gain on so that they're not getting too skinny and they can continue to be healthy and, and produce milk for us. Nice. So you guys haven't been in operation with the robots milking and harvesting the, the cow's milk for a year yet, but um, no, six months. So wh why did you why did you go with robots? Why was robots the right choice for Sheldon Creek Dairy? Um, yeah, so robots are 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 a way a way to um, to become better managers of your farm um, with less labor intensive chores. And so they're not, they're not the right answer for every farm, but for us and for a lot of farmers across, across the, the globe, they are the right answer. Um, for us, we are located pretty close to the big city of Toronto. Um, and we also have a large uh, car manufacturing plant in Alliston, Honda. And so it's really hard for us to find labor that wants to work on a farm, that wants to milk cows. Um, and not only labor, but labor that, that is trainable and that's, that knows what a cow looks like and knows the basics of how to milk a cow and, and how to react around, around animals, around large animals. Um, and so robots really fit for us because, um, because of the shortage, I would say, of labor that we had around here for physical work. Um, it really helps us, as far as myself goes, I really enjoy the technical side of things and I really enjoy having all that data and I would say that with the robots um, and everything that comes with the robots, we have so much more information on these cows um, and, and I'm able to manage them, my, myself and my dad and, and everyone else here, we're able to manage the cows and, and to look at them every day and see which ones are healthy and, and we can tell which ones are going off and which ones are, are maybe getting a little sick even before, before there's any clinical signs of it, before there's any sign that they've gone down, we know that these cows need to be, this cow needs to be looked at for whatever reason, and we can go look at them and we can, we can treat them. And oftentimes maybe you just give them a little bit more vitamin or you give them a little bit more um, sugar and it just, it helps them to jump back a lot faster. And the faster that you can get onto those, those kind of things, the better it is for the cow and the better it is for, for the farm because because there's, there's nothing worse than having a sick cow and nobody wants to have a sick cow. It's not profitable, it's not healthy, and it's not, it's just not good for the farm, so. You know, we built this barn based on the happiness of a cow, right? So when we built this barn, Emily and Dad and, and all the people that help us figure out, you know, what does this look like? Um, it was based on how do we make our cows happiest? And one of the ways of doing that was to put the voluntary milking system in. The fact that, the, you know, we can't find labor to milk our cows three times a, a day, but we can find you know, the investment of building a robotic barn with the robot that allows our cows to choose when they get milked. And often when you tell people that, people are blown away, right? And I think that's really exciting. And on top of that, Laylee really prides themselves in the animal health and well-being of, of cows. 
And on top of that, it also talks about free fatty acids. And on a processing side, you know, that is a big concern because you need to make sure that that, that milk, when it is harvested, is of high, high quality. And Lely has, has done a lot of great research um, in Holland and when laying out how the robotic system was going to be in place and the lines that that milk was going to travel. You know, all of those things came into play and there's a lot of knowledge on that. And that was very helpful to ensure that the quality of product continued to stay high from, you know, our old barn to the barn that we have today. So you, you guys are no different than 99%, I think, of every dairy farmer in the country when, when we talk about labor. We just have this relentless quantity and quality void um, coming about. And to your point, as uh, millennials and we, as we look at the next generation of the workforce coming in, they want to be more hands-on with technology versus doing repetitive things day in day out so so I appreciate you guys recognizing that labor challenge but Emily you had I, I'm lucky because I got to go to your farm um, in the past year and I was blown away with how clean the facility was how clean the cows were I mean, I would have no problem dropping my potato chip on your barn floor and eating it. <laughs> I'd, feel more, I'd certainly feel more safe doing that there than I would, eh, you know, maybe in other places that we all go to. So my point is, is you had a very close relationship with those cows. Now that you've transitioned to the robot barn, what does your relationship look like with your cows? Yeah, you're right. It's, um, it's definitely changed and it's been a, a really big learning curve. We, um, we have always really strived to keep all of our cows healthy. You know, we, it goes back to that pedigree. We want to keep these cows around for, for many generations and we want to keep their offspring alive and, and keep that family tree growing. That's really important to us. Um, and so individual, like knowing the cows individually um, in the old barn, it was, it was relatively easy because you stood beside them and you milked them every day and you saw exactly what they eat, ate every day. Um, and then you come into a freestyle barn and the cows are roaming everywhere and you maybe don't see a cow every day because when you're on one side of the barn, they walk to the other side of the barn or, or um, as some people say, the, the best cows in the herd you don't see every day because they do their own thing and they don't need your attention. And so um, that was a huge learning curve in itself, but thankfully, and we're really thankful of this, we had a lot of great advisors um, in building and in planning for our startup. And so we put our rumination tags on, um, the Laley rumination tags that go with the, uh, the robots. And those have, uh, they've given us so much information, it's, um, it's unreal. I couldn't imagine starting up, going from a Thai style barn to a freestyle barn without them because I feel like we didn't we didn't skip a beat in knowing what's going on with our cows. Uh, the cows obviously got stressed out coming over to the barn, and and so did we. Um, <laughs> Just like you do when you move <laughs> yeah. into a new house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, but you could stay on top of it. You knew which cows were were transitioning really well, and which cows maybe needed a little bit more assistance with that. And so that data we look at. I look at it every day. At the beginning, I was looking at it six times a day. Um, now I look at it twice a day, and if there's a cow that's off, then I look at it more often just for her. Um, but we have the, I would say that I know, I don't see the cows like I did. I don't see every cow every day, twice a day anymore, but I know a lot more about each individual cow than I ever did. Um, and I think that goes for everybody. My dad's the same. He looks at the computer and, and he's amazed at what, what information he has. I mean, he, his father milked cows by hand. So he went from knowing that with his dad, well, he never saw that, but, yeah. <laughs> but he, he's heard about it, um, to now being able to see how much milk, not only how much milk these cows give, but that some of the cows go in four times a day and some of them, um, you know, they ruminate so many hours a day and, and it shows you when they're in heat. And um, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing how far the technology has come and how much you can know about the cows um, just by looking at the numbers. <laughs> I'm going to give a shout out to Emily because she's so humble over here. But like when we do tours, my favorite thing to do is like, hey, so Emily, what's that cow's name? And Emily knows every single cow in this barn. 
uh, and she knows her mother and she knows even, you know, we have a cow sitting over in the pack right now who's going to uh, calve out soon. And Emily said the other day, yeah, it's her birthday on June 15th. <laughs> you know, it's just like, um, yeah. I don't know all their birthdays. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only the special cows, yeah. Emily. Do you have favorites? Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty cool that Emily can literally uh, name off each cow. I think what's even like, as on top of that is that um, with these Laylee robots, you know, 10 years ago, we were all talking in the industry of how to feed the world by 2020. Like, that was a big thing. T- even five years ago, there was conferences on it. You know, we're a year away from 2020, and we are feeding the world. And you know how we're doing that? We've adopted technologies like this. We are doing a better job, more efficiently than we've ever done in the, in the past. We're growing safer food than we ever have in the past because we've adopted some really great technologies in the industry to allow us to do that. And I think that, you know, it's a, it's a very exciting thing to be in a barn like this, but I think what's really unique about that is if, if only my Opa could see it now, you know, I think he'd be shocked of the technology but I think he'd be even more shocked of the health and the happiness of the cows and how great of a job as a farmer you can do now because of the data that you have on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute um, basis. And that's what the Laylee robot gives us. I also just want to add to that, that we, you know, we, Marianne was just saying about feeding the world in 2020 and how we're getting there and how we have the safest food that we've ever had. Um, and the other, the other side to that is that us as farmers, um, we need to make sure that the consumer is educated on these technologies that are coming up and these technologies that are being used. And that's what we're doing with these tours is we have a lot of people come in and um, and on the outside, maybe they're wondering, you know, what does a milking robot look like? Like, <laughs> does it like wander around the barn and just go up to cows and milk them out? Like, what does it look like? Right. And they're amazed when they come in and they see a cow literally waiting at the robot for the next cow to go out so that they can get in there. Like they're they're just they're amazed at how comfortable the cows are here and how how they want to be milked, which makes complete sense, right? And then you bring them into the robot and they get to see the milk coming out of each quarter. When you open up and they can see the, the collection jar and, and the milk coming out of each individual quarter, like in the now, like as it's happening, that's really, that's always the eye-opening moment for them. The, the first eye-opening moment is when they walk into the barn and they just see this big, bright space that's nicely ventilated and the second moment is when they see that milk that is in real time coming out of that cow um, and it looks it, it's pure it's clean and it's healthy it's it's exactly what they drink on their on their in their cereal in the morning um, and so that's something big and that's something big that we thought about when we first started thinking about putting robots in is that we have to be the myth we have to myth bust that that there are a lot of people that have misconceptions about technology and agriculture and if we're going to feed the world in 2020 which we are and we already are doing um then we need to make sure that the consumers on side as well because they're the ones that have to buy into it they are they are our customers so a million thank yous for what you ladies are doing for I guess first of all having the vision um, you know Emily I, I think you've got how many daughters there in the barn how many how many cows are in the barn <laughs> daughters <laughs> I like that um, so there's 65 milking and then we have about 20 we have 175 on the farm so sorry Marianne she's she's outpacing you you've only got yeah. two and she's got a hundred and some kids really <laughs> I should have sent her a Mother's Day card. I didn't even think yeah. of that. Yeah, what, what were you year. thinking? <laughs> but all of those, all of those cows, heifers, calves, at whatever stage in their life cycle that they're at, are being taken care of with an eye on them all the time. And thank you for bringing and inviting the consumer, the world, to your doorstep. I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge commitment. It's it can be a risk at times. Um, but for serving as those myth busters. So I just got a million questions, but we only have so much time today. How have the robots changed the farm? Uh, yeah, sure. So the robots have um, by far improved them. I would say they have done nothing but what we've wanted them to do and what we have hoped for in moving to this barn. Um, 
to to make it clear though it's not just like when you put robots in you're not just putting robots in you're putting a robotic system in and the robotic system is the whole barn so um a lot of the time we have you have people who well not at, not so much anymore but in the beginning there was a lot of people who maybe put a robot into a retrofit barn and i, th I think i heard of one person who put a robot into a tie stall barn thinking that they'd get in and out of their own stalls but um, the thinking has has revolved so much as robots have improved and as as people have tried them out and there's been those foregoers who have found what the what what works and what doesn't work and now we know that when you build a robot barn everything revolves around those robots because that's where that's where the cows need to be, feel comfortable and that's where the cows need to want to go and so when we built this barn we built it for cow comfort that was our number one thing we wanted to make sure that you know cows wanted to lie down cows wanted to drink and they could drink in virtually any space that they were at they could take 20 steps and they'd be at a watering watering hole or if they wanted to eat they knew where it was and it was close um, so we built a parameter barn so there's feed on either side of where the cows are and we have six water bowls in the front um, so uh, another big thing about freestyle barns is bully cows, um, and we have bully cows. There's, there's every farm has a bull, bully cow, um, and so they always say that you want to have circles and you want to have it so that the the shy cow, if she doesn't want to, if she sees the bull, bully at the end of one row, she can go the other way and she can still get to the robot or still get to the water or still get to the feed, or wherever she wants to go. You got to make sure that each cow is comfortable, and so. We, whenever we built this barn, we literally, we did every cow path, you know, if, if she's a timid cow and she's here, or if she's um, a little bit sick and she's here, how do we get her here? How do we, how do we treat her? How do we deal with this cow in this situation? And um, so we did that. And so uh, we are really happy with our end product um, of the barn and of the robots and the robots have, uh, really within four weeks we were up to 40 liters which is um it was our goal to be at 42 within the first year and uh we got there within uh six weeks of being into this barn um so uh to say that they've done what we have hoped for uh would be an understatement i think so so you're really you're really really realizing the potential of all the of all the heifers all the cows i mean much yeah quicker. they're they're shocking you yeah they are and um they say uh like a lot of people ask you how many cows you got rid of because of the robots and really you shouldn't be getting rid of cows because of the robots the reason that some cows left our farm was um was a because we were producing too much milk and we didn't we didn't need it so there was no use in paying for that extra milk kind of thing um so we took off the bottom end but now that you have all this information about each individual cow you know what the weaknesses were in the old barn and you can highlight them and you can realize which cows are it's not so much that they're not going into the robot and they're not getting milked it may be another issue that that you never saw before because you didn't have that information and you didn't have that technology so it sounds like you're really managing to the unique qualities and differences of each individual cow. You're still milking in mass, but you you have so much more information at your fingertips about the individual different ones. That's right, yeah. When a cow goes off, you just click on their cow card and immediately you can tell, you know, when did they start going off? If it's the first day that they started going off, then you just monitor them and you can you can you can look at each, each individual cow. You can look at them so closely, more than you could just standing and looking at them. So my curiosity, my curiosity is kind of killing me here. And you're only six months in, but when you when you finally flipped the switch and it was startup and you were a few weeks in, who was the transition? Who was the transition more difficult for the cows or the humans? Oh, definitely the humans. A hundred percent. Four weeks in, two weeks in, the cows were lying in stalls and doing their own thing. And we were like, we were stressing out. <laughs> yeah. you, you're too busy. Just, you're too much of busybodies. Just couldn't let them lay, could you? Yeah. <laughs> they say three week, or three days, three weeks, three months, right? Yeah. So the first three days, you're, you know, 
encouraging the cows to get through the robot. Emily was here like 24 hours, just like, we we're like, you should just set up a cot in the barn. <laughs> um, but you know, you're just like getting the cows used to their new surroundings. And then after three weeks, you're like, okay, this is good. Everything is going well, but you're still trying to figure everything out. And then by three months, you go, oh, how did we ever live without this? Um, and I think that's really, that was the moment of, you know, this is really great. The cows are happy when you walk in the barn. Even people that walk in the barn go, wow, look how happy your cows are, right? That's, um, that's an, that just is an accomplishment because you think of all the research that went into building this barn and the amount of time that Emily took on, you know, figuring out what that barn looks, that barn was going to look like. And then it all coming together and at three months, recognizing that the achievements that she was hoping for were coming a lot faster than what she ever anticipated. So what was the startup process like? I think you guys did start up in December. Yeah, so we had we started up <laughs> December 4th. Okay, so f- four days before Christmas Eve. What was your Christmas experience like this year as compared to every other year? <laughs> Um, you know what? It was, uh, it's kind of been deleted from my memory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a, it was an horrible, it, like when you think back on it, um, so we have one person that helps us out, Haley. She's actually apprentice, apprenticing as a dairy herds person there. We had two hired help and then there was the four of us that were here pushing cows. So there were six of us in total and uh, by Christmas, so we moved in December 4th, so three weeks was Christmas. And by Christmas time, there was pretty much three of us that had it figured out. Um, it was just, you know, one thing would happen and you had to figure out how to fix it. And uh, that always happens on a Sunday or on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day. It just seems to be that way. It was still, it was still okay because it was all new and you, you still have the adrenaline of moving in and, and of having a, a new toy to play with. There was a steep learning curve, that's for sure. It's all worth it now. And we just had that, that oh, this is all worth it the other day when um, it was a nice day. So we were spreading manure and we were cleaning out, um, we were cleaning out pens. And we didn't have to stop to milk. We just kept going. <laughs> that was our big, like, this is why we put robots in right here. <laughs> Super. So you're you're six months in now harvesting milk with robots. How does it help with the with the uh, creamery with the things going on there at Sheldon Creek in the processing plant? Yeah. So I guess the the nice thing is is that um, you know we've got one we've we've always had great quality milk, but now we have some really great data or data on that. Um, we also have the A2 milk being segregated. That was a big thing for here. So we have two different bulk tanks, two separate lines. Um, and that was a great thing about the Lely robot. We worked with Grand River Robotics, who was an excellent help on that, um, wealth of knowledge to help us achieve that goal of having the segregated milk system. And so um, that's, that's been a great thing. I guess the other thing is, is that as the, the dairy grows, now we do have some growth opportunity here on the farm side. So we're continuing to buy quota when it comes up um, and purchase more cows as that, as that happens as well. This barn can hold 120 milking cows. So um, before we were kind of, you know, we were just at our capacity on the farm side. And now we're finding that we're at the capacity on the creamery or the dairy side, the creamery mm-hmm. side. So um, I guess that will be the next expansion plan. So let's go back to the food part of it. That's what we all like to fill our tummies with is all the yummy products. So how did you decide what products to offer at Sheldon Creek? Do you want the honest answer? (laughs) (laughs) Mistakes. Mistakes, It all happens. It all happens from mistakes. No, I'm just kidding. But honestly, innovation. um, I think if if you look at our management team, it's funny. We have a management team, but that management team is also family members, right? Um, But as on a business side of things, we are definitely a management team. And if you look at the qualities that we all share, we're all innovative people. We all think innovatively. Um, we all think outside the box. Um, some of us are more dreamers than, you know, real, realistic thinkers, I guess you'd say, <laughs> which is a really good balance to have. Um, yeah, that's awesome. It is. You know, we've got the perfect storm. We've got the perfect group of people um, helping to ensure that our business is successful. And uh, it's just a reality that we're also all family. So that's, that's pretty great. But... Uh, yeah, innovation is key. So often um, products come out of, you know, we've got an extra 300 liters of milk. What do you want to do with it this week? 
oh, let's, you know, put it into culture product and we'll make it into smoothies. Oh, what kind of flavors should we do? Okay, well, strawberries are available right now. Blueberries are Ontario. Peaches are Ontario. You know, let's try those, those types of flavors and, and we'll launch it at the farmer's market this week on sale and see what customers think. Um, thankfully, we haven't launched a product yet that we haven't um, been able to sell. <laughs> We've been very lucky, I guess. But, uh, you know, our, our customers tell us a lot. And we're very thankful to have such a great customer um, base that push us as well. You know, they see products in other countries or other places or even products that they make at home. And they come to us and they say, you know, you should make kefir. Kefir is a great probiotic. I drink it every day, but I just, you know, I don't really want to make it anymore. It takes too much time. You should, you should try making kefir. So what do we do? We get a 20 liter pail of milk. We get some kefir cultures and we make kefir. Um, this was five years ago and now we make 600 liters a week of kefir, right? So um, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, being able to be flexible, being able to think outside the box and also realizing that you know, small business only survives through innovation and change. We cannot compete on price. We cannot compete on marketing dollars, but we can definitely compete on quality and, and you know, product development. And so that's why we've, uh, this past year, we, we did a flavor of the month each month. So instead of just having your regular white milk and chocolate milk, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do more flavors? So we did a creamsicle, we do strawberry, salted caramel, pumpkin spice, eggnog, um, we just launched uh, Irish cream this past year and we relaunched, which was a mistake about uh, eight years ago, Neapolitan milk, which was a mistake that had happened. Um, my parents had went away for the first time since pretty much their honeymoon yep. and left Emily and I on the farm alone. Anyway, um, we put a little bit of strawberry milk into the chocolate, not realizing it, and it created a delicious uh, mistake called Neapolitan milk. <laughs> And we sold all of those leaders eight years ago. Um, and every year since then, we always got the email saying, hey, just wondering if Neapolitan's coming back. And every year we'd say, nope, it was a mistake. Please, like, you know, <laughs> we'd like to forget about that. Anyway, um, this year we decided that maybe we'd make that mistake something legit. So we made Neapolitan milk this past, uh, this past month. So it's just, you know, it's fun. And I remember when mom and dad first dreamt of doing the on-farm dairy, one of the things was that it had to be fun. You know, to be honest, they thought it was going to be a retirement gig, yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> we look back now, we're like, what? How did you ever, you know? Um, it was quite the dream to have it as a retirement gig. I think yeah. they'd be just as busy um, if, if it was <laughs> supposed to be like that. Um, but yeah, so I think it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. There's lots of challenges with on-farm dairy. There's lots of, of challenges, but that whole part of that is the, the ride of being an entrepreneur. And when you've got your family by your side and um, a great team working with you, you know, those challenges are also exciting and getting to the successes of those challenges is even more exciting. So gosh, you can carry a whole bunch of different titles, mom, marketeer, innovator, entrepreneur, and recipeologist. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, on my, on my business card, people are like, oh, what's your, you know, your title? I'm like, uh, I just want to be like dot, 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 you know? <laughs> you fill in the blank. You fill it in, whatever you want me to be. <laughs> Makes sense. So, okay, so you've got the milk, the yogurt, the kefir, what else? We're actually launching uh, single serve kefirs this past, uh, in another month. Um, so we're going to be doing some really unique flavors with kefir and launching it on a single serve so that people can, you know, take it to work or um, drink it after their run. Or, you know, maybe they're not just feeling so great, so they need a little bit of a probiotic boost. So we're working on a, product, uh, a new product line with that. Um, we've been really focused on the A2 milk now that we've got it started and introducing that to Ontario market. Um, yeah, we've got some really, you know, uh, great flavors coming out. We had some great flavors last year, but um, pumpkin spice, salted caramel, strawberry milk, you know, those are all going to stay again this year, and we'll have a couple more unique flavors that will come out. So I, I guess the thing is, is like, you know, there's nothing more than getting excited as to like what's next. And I think that's, that's really the goal for us is to keep our customers on their toes and asking what's next because... You know, when you, you throw a new product out there like coffee milk this past month 
Uh, people call and say, does this milk freeze really well? Because like, I just can't live without it for another nine months or 12 months or whatever it is, right? That's a, that's a lot of fun. That's, that's exciting. So let's remind everybody, it, we're, we're here in the summer season now and people are looking for things to fill their, their days with the kids home at school. Where can they find the farm? And then where can they find your products? For sure. So you can find the farm in Loretto. If you go on to our website, www.sheldoncreekdairy.ca, you can find um, how to get here. Uh, we are open every single day of the week, and we also are serving ice cream now that the summer mo- or the spring months are here, I guess. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it, but it's here. So all ice cream lovers rejoice. It's open. Um, we'll have our milkshakes as well and our ice cream cookies. And then um, you can find our products all over Ontario and on our website as well. There's like a, a locator app that you can actually find the, the store that's closest to you. And of course, we're always available by phone. You can give us a shout on the phone or send us an email and we'll get back to you there. Okay, awesome. So here in the month of June, the 15th, what's the time? What's the address? How? What's going on on June 15th? Yeah, so June 15th is a great day to come to the farm. It's our annual day on the farm. It's our eighth annual. I couldn't believe that when I wrote that, but eighth annual day on the farm. It's June 15th, and it's from 10 until 2. Um, It's a great day to come, tour the barn. There's also live music, cooking demonstrations, a farmer's market. There's educational sessions from different commodities all throughout the day. Um, You can meet the the chickens up close. They'll be here. Um, There's also going to be pigs, alpacas, um, and just a great day to, you know, get some great education from, I don't want to say the horse's mouth, but <laughs> farmers, uh, <laughs> farmers from the local area, um, and, and really, you know, ask those questions that you've had those burning desire for. Yeah, because you've got all the different species, a lot of the different commodity groups, uh, all the different ingredients that go into whether it be cereal or steaks or poultry, What a great way for the consumer and fellow agricultural farmers to get more information about the great products and the great proteins we can put on people's plates and and in their glasses. So anything else coming up for the summer months? Any sweet corn or any any other yummy in-season products? Yes, we've got uh, sweet corn that will be July, hopefully. Just depends on weather, but July, August, we'll have the sweet corn. Um, In terms of new products... You know, it's kind of a secret until the month comes. So you just have to follow us on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or Twitter. Um, That's usually where we announce them. And we announce them um, usually a couple days before or the day that we're making them if we're really sneaky. (laughs) We'll put out the feelers, though. Usually people get a little taste of, you know, some guessing games before it actually launches. Nice. Well, I'm sure we will have a group of taste testers lining up after listening to this so oh i know what else the s'more recipe um so the milkshake recipe will be available for the month of june as well so we're going to be making a canadian s'more milkshake that will be available at the dairy bar for the month of june yum can you describe what that is a little bit more for sure so there's nothing greater than a s'more in the summer months you know it brings back those campfire memories or those days as kids you know learning to roast a marshmallow maybe sometimes burning them don't worry we're not burning any marshmallows here but so we're going to be making that uh, milkshake with some chocolate ice cream Um, of course our whole milk as well as graham uh, wafer crumbs um, marshmallows and that marshmallow will be um, crisped on top, um, just using, actually, not using fire, but using a torch. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, deliciousness in one cup, and you can find it at the dairy bar for the month of June. And it has zero calories, that's right, folks. Zero calories in that wonderful, yummy <laughs> fact check. graham Don't cracker. Fact check that. Don't fact check Chocolate, that. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Well, Emily and Marianne, I really appreciate you ladies taking the time to share your story um, in the dairy industry to all of us here at Dairy Robot Radio. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and follow you all online. And anyone who has questions about how we harvest milk, how dairy farmers harvest milk with Laley technology, or how dairy products are produced, the Denhands in Loretto, Ontario are a great place for you to learn firsthand from authentic dairy producers where you can see the entire process. And if you can't drive to their doorstep, just find them online. Thank you so much and have a great summer, ladies. Thank you, you too.
You've been listening to Dairy Robot Radio, the show for dairy producers who want their questions answered by experts in dairy automation. Connect with us at dairyrobotradio.com to listen to all episodes and learn more about the topics and guests on the show. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify.